Hey everyone, and welcome to the population regulation mini lecture. Um, you'll find the web page if you want to follow along. It's just called population regulation. Now, last week we went through the mathematics of exponential growth, and we talked a little bit about how exponential growth is so powerful and it's not sustainable over too many generations because at some point, no matter how slowly, how uh, small your your R is, or intrinsic rate of population growth, as long as it's positive, with enough time, the population will take over the planet and the universe given enough time. So there has to be some way to stop that incredible power of exponential growth. We talked about Thomas Malthus in the previous lecture and how he kind of used that idea of limits to growth to make kind of a dire uh, prediction about the future of human populations and the need to suppress population growth and to focus uh, more on improving quality of life than improving uh, reproductive rates. Um, so that was what we talked about in the previous lecture, and we built a insight maker model to make that concept of exponential growth and limits to growth a little more uh, tangible. What we're going to do in today's lecture is talk about a model that's a little less catastrophic than the model we built in the last demo in the Malthus lecture. We're going to talk about logistic population growth and um, um, the, the density-dependent population model that Gotelli talks about in chapter two of his book. That on, and I think that chapter is entitled Logistic Growth. So, so let's get started. First, we should probably define density. So when we talk about density-dependent population regulation, we're often you know, referring to this logistic growth model that Gotelli goes through in chapter two. And when we use the term density, we're talking about the number of conspecific individuals in the population that any individual in the population is competing with for food and other resources. So the more you compete with others of your own species for food and other resources, the less favorable your vital rates are likely to be. When I say less favorable your vital rates will likely to be, it means the per capita birth rate is likely to go down, which is less favorable for the population, and the per capita death rate is likely to increase which is also, of course, less favorable to the population. So as N, or the population abundance, goes up, or density goes up, vital rates take a turn for the worse. That's what we mean when we say density dependence. The vital rates, birth rate, death rate, and potentially immigration and other vital rates are likely to change depending on the uh, density in the population, and specifically, the vital rates are likely to become less favorable for population growth. All right, so birth rates goes down, death rate goes up. And let's uh, talk a little bit more about what we mean by regulation, because that is in the title of today's lecture, what is regulation? Well, we mentioned in our systems ecology discussion that positive feedbacks are unsustainable. Positive feedbacks are unsustainable because as the amount in the stock goes up, the rate of influx into the stock goes up, and that is runaway growth. And we can visualize that in this whiteboard where we see that we can look at abundance over time. And if we have time one, the abundance might be here and the rate of growth might be fairly small, so the next time step might be here, but now that the population is bigger, the rate of growth is going up, so you'll have even more in the population at the next time step. The, the amount of inflow into the population goes up, and now that the population is bigger, the rate of growth goes up even more, so you have rate of growth small, larger, and then even larger in the next time step, and so you can see that this kind of creates this runaway growth that is not sustainable. That is the opposite of sustainable. So now let's think about the opposite type of feedback. So this we call positive feedback. Uh, 
<laughs> it's hard to write uh, in this whiteboard, but that's feedback. <laughs> that is spelled F-E-E-D-B-A-C-K, as you can see there. Sorry about the, the, the writing difficulties. But let's um, think about negative feedback. That's what we're thinking about in this lecture today. So here we go. Abundance and time. Now we can start to think about, let's start the same kind of same kind of place here. We have abundance up here. Now um, the next time step, maybe there's a little bit of growth, right? Just like we had before. Um, and the population grows to here. So you have this little bit of growth in this first time step here, this time jump here. And what we see now is that now that the population is bigger, the vital rates goes down and the rate of growth goes down, the rate of influx into the population goes down, and in the next time step, perhaps it goes down to here. And maybe in the next time step, now that it's you know further down, um, the population size is reduced, the vital rates go up, it's kind of the opposite direction. The smaller the population is, the more favorable the vital rates, the larger the population, the less favorable the vital rates. So you can see that maybe you just sort of bounce back and forth like this, and what you see is basically stable population size over time. This is what's called negative density dependence. Density dependence or negative, maybe I'll just say negative feedback is what we should call it right now. It's also called negative density dependence. And the difference between positive and negative feedback now is clearly this difference that as positive feedback, you see that as population size goes up, the vital rates become more favorable and the, the growth rate becomes more, uh, becomes even higher. That's positive feedback and negative feedback is the opposite where as abundance goes up, the vital rates get less favorable. And as abundance goes down, the vital rates become more favorable. I guess I could complete the thought here and say that as abundance goes down, vital rates become less favorable. So these are um, the difference between positive and negative feedback. All right. So that's an important concept that we will come back to regularly. It's an important concept, not just in population ecology, but in biology in general, where uh, negative feedbacks are everywhere. Where Anytime you see a regulated biological system, an organism, for instance, with homeostasis, you have a stabilizing negative feedback uh, that's involved somewhere in there that keeps the system at some constant level. Just like we saw here in a negative feedback, we see that the system itself remains in a kind of equilibrium or homeostatic state. So that's negative feedbacks. We can imagine, you know, like um, in organismal biology, the blood sugar goes up, the body will do its best to lower it. And when blood sugar goes down, the body will do its best to increase. And that's how negative feedbacks create stability and homeostasis. So that's what we mean when we talk about population regulation. There's some process, some negative feedback process that's causing the vital rates to become less and less favorable as the, the abundance gets higher. And at some point you reach an equilibrium state where the inflow and the outflow are equal. All right. So we'll come back to equilibria in a second, but just to uh, raise some questions related to density dependent population regulation here. Let's just raise some thought questions. What are some possible mechanisms of density dependence? Now we'll talk about this more in lab, uh, in lab two, but it's worth thinking about because you know this these mathematical formulas, you know that they're great and really important. But it's always important to bring it back to the real systems, the, the wild populations that we're really considering here. So 
Just take a minute to think about a population that you're interested in and how density dependence might actually work in that case. What makes vital rates potentially? What makes birth rate go down as, as population goes up? What makes death rate go up potentially as population size goes up? What resource becomes the most limiting? What life stage is most affected by density? Maybe it's the juveniles in the population that are most affected by um, density and that their, their mortality goes way up when the population becomes too dense. So it's different in different populations, but it's always worth trying to bring it back to real systems. And the second question here is, is are all wild populations regulated? Is density dependent population regulation a law of nature? And that's a question that, you know, people have been debating for, for a long time. We always kind of look for laws of nature, especially ecologists like to think about um, are there laws of ecology? Because ecology is so messy, it's hard to come up with laws that are true across the board. Um, is this one of them? Density dependent population regulation. We've already talked about dense, like exponential growth leads to craziness. It's not sustainable. So something has to step in to stop exponential growth from going on unregulated for too long. So perhaps we could think about it as a law of nature, essentially, that um, at some point, species and populations have to be able to self-regulate and there has to be some mechanism, some density-dependent negative feedback mechanism that causes a stabilization of the population over time. All right, next I'd like to get a little bit into the mathematics. We'll go over the mathematics more in lab two, but I just want to give you a head start and you know, looking at these equations and understanding these equations. So let's take a quick minute to look at this uh, basic equation of population regulation or logistic growth. This can be, and I like to think of this as the second most important equation of population ecology after the basic exponential growth equation. So first of all, th this is the, the equation. It's the, the change in population size is equal to the intrinsic rate of growth, R, times N, times this other term, 1 minus N, the population size, over K, K being carrying capacity, or the total number of individuals that can be supported based on the resources that are available. All right, so that is the equation that can describe what we call logistic growth, or um, density dependent population regulation. So the first part of the equation looks, looks very familiar, right? So delta N equals R times N. That's the basic equation, equation of exponential growth. Now let's just dig into that second part a little bit. So one minus N over K, what does that mean? So we can think about the, the second part, N over K, as the used portion of carrying capacity. So if the population size is at carrying capacity, then carrying capacity might be 100, so we have 100 individuals in the population and carrying capacity of 100, then carrying capacity is filled up. It's all used up, right? So N over K is equal to one. The used portion of carrying capacity is 100%. It is used up. And if N is really low relative to K, then most of the carrying capacity is unused, right? So if we, one minus N over K represents the unused portion of carrying capacity, all right? So if N is, say, two, and K is 100, then one, then two, two over 100 is 2%, right? So the used portion of carrying capacity is 2%, one minus point, O2, right? 1 minus 0 0.02 is 0.98 or 98%. 98% of the population of carrying capacity is unused, all right? And furthermore, if we look at this equation now, this is the unused portion of carrying capacity. This is the basic exponential growth rate, essentially. If the unused portion of carrying capacity is really high, essentially, mostly unused, right, one minus N over, over K is really high, essentially, it's close to one, then the population growth resembles exponential growth, right? And if 
unused portion of carrying capacity is really low, and this number is really low, like say, you know, zero, then this basically cancels out and the population growth is zero. So as carrying capacity gets filled up, the population growth becomes closer and closer to zero, all right? So we can think of it another way. When carrying capacity is mostly unused, population growth resembles exponential growth. And when carrying capacity is mostly used up, population growth resembles no growth at all. And we can look at this in the whiteboard and we can start to kind of figure out what logistic growth actually looks like, what this model actually looks like. If we plot abundance over time, we have abundance and we have time. And we know that if we start at a really low abundance, the population's going to, the growth is gonna look like exponential growth, at least for a little while as the population is small, right? So the population growth is looking like exponential growth. And then at the other end, we know that once the population reaches carrying capacity, growth is gonna be stable. There's gonna be really no population growth, right? So we know these two pieces, like in this area, the population is fairly small relative to carrying capacity. And the population is therefore going to kind of look like exponential growth in this region while the population is small. Right, And then in this region, the population is at carrying capacity. And so this is stable growth at carrying capacity or stable population. Now, what's going to happen in the middle? Well, we can kind of intuit that the growth rate has to start declining at some point. And so it's going to, if we just want to connect this up, it's going to start looking like this. The growth rate is going to slow down and we get this S-shaped curve that is how we represent, uh, you know, population growth over time under this model. The model that we just looked at that is described as this. So the growth rate at any point in time, at any given, you know, uh, level of abundance can be computed by taking the intrinsic rate of growth, R, times the abundance, and then multiply it by the degree to which carrying capacity is unused, right? So that is the implication of the, the uh, logistic growth model. We'll go over it more in lab, um, in lab two. So, um, before we move on to the insight maker activity related to logistic population growth, let's just think a little bit about equilibria. So the, the, the concept of equilibrium comes up many times in this class and pretty much anytime we engage in systems thinking and think about uh, stocks and flows and feedbacks and that kind of thing. So this, uh, this figure is, is a obviously a very gross simplification of how population growth actually happens, where we have a bucket being filled by a hose. Now, this isn't a perfect representation because the hose itself is flowing at a certain rate regardless of the amount of water in the bucket, right? So it's not really a good analog for a, a real population where obviously there's going to be a greater rate of flow um, the bigger the the amount of water in the bucket just due to the nature of exponential growth but what this figure starts to illustrate is the fact that at some point the inflows the inflows being what's coming in from the hose is going to equal the outflow at some point um, we can imagine that the flow in might be fairly low and that the bucket might not even fill up before these holes uh, cause the outflow to equal the inflow and the level of water will stabilize within the, um, within the bucket, right? At some level below the top of the bucket. 
because the inflow and as long as the inflow equals the outflow, the level in the bucket does not change. That is an equilibrium. When the inflow equals the outflow, the system is at equilibrium. Now, in this system, if the these holes in the bucket aren't enough to um, to make the outflow and the inflow equal, at some point the bucket will be filled and will overflow, and that kind of represents the absolute maximum uh, of water that can be in. That's, at this point, the inflow and the outflow have to be equal because whatever whatever inflow is coming in and overflowing, uh, whatever inflow is coming in will overflow once the bucket is, is full, right? So the inflow and the outflow have to be equal and, it, and therefore the equilibrium is at the top. So equilibria are a really important concept and it's simple too because they're like the only thing you have to think about is that the inflow and the outflow have to be equal. That is the only thing that defines an equilibrium, all right? So carrying capacity is an equilibrium point. Carrying capacity is that point where the inflow and the outflow are equal, right? So this point here, because the inflow and outflow are equal, the population size n is not changing, and that is necessarily an equilibrium condition. So we have an equilibrium. Opposing forces cancel each other out, and we'll go over this more in lab on Friday or next Friday, whatever, whenever you're watching this video, lab two, and uh, we'll derive the logistic growth equation um, in more detail. But suffice it to say at this point that these two equations end up describing logistic population growth. So basically what we're saying here is that, and in a way this is a, this is, illustrates what we mean when we say density dependence in a very nice way. The birth rate at any point in time can be computed as the maximum birth rate minus some, some coefficient A uh, times density. So we don't worry too much. This is just kind of the slope of the relationship between birth rate and density. All right. So as, as density goes up, birth rate goes down because of this minus sign here. As, de as density goes up, this term becomes bigger and this whole term here becomes smaller, right? So birth rate's going down with density. Death rate is going up with density in a similar way. So if you want to compute death rate at any point in time, little d per capita death rate is computed as the minimum per capita death rate plus some coefficient, some slope, times the density. So as density goes up, this term becomes bigger, as does this term, because it's just added to whatever the minimum death rate is. So we have these two equations, and you should recognize these equations as representing lines. Basically, y equals mx plus b, which means you know a linear relationship. Birth rate is equal to some intercept plus or sorry, minus uh, this term here. So you have a negative slope and here you have a positive slope. So let's draw this relationship out in the whiteboard. So in this case, we are looking at density dependence this way. So instead of putting time on the x-axis, I'm gonna put density on the x-axis, all right? And here you have the vital rate. Now I will make birth rate green. So you have birth rate starting off at a really high level. So this, this initial birth, I'll, I'll call it B max. So the maximum birth rate, and as the, the abundance goes up, the birth rate goes down, all right? Now I'll make death rate red. So the death rate starts off really low, right? So you have the minimum death rate, the most favorable death rate. And as the abundance goes up, the death rate goes up too, okay? So that's what we're defining. When we look at these two, two equations, you have a negative relationship, birth rate goes down with density, death rate goes up with density, and that visually just looks like 
this. Birth rate goes down with density. Death rate goes up with density. Can you see where the equilibrium point is going to be in this figure? Remember, equilibrium is where the inflow and the outflows are equal and that abundance will not change at the, that point. So the equilibrium point is up here. Birth rate and death rate are equal. If you want to look at this figure, it's pretty easy to see where that point occurs. And it's right here, right? That's where the equilibrium occurs and it's at an abundance that's right here. So if you just track this down here, you'll see that the equilibrium occurs at this very specific abundance. That abundance is known as carrying capacity or K, right? So that's carrying capacity because it's the equilibrium point where the birth rate and the death rate are equal and therefore the flows are equal. Inflow is equal to outflow. There's no change in abundance over time. So that's one way to look at carrying capacity and at population regulation. Now the other thing, every time we see an equilibrium, every time we think about an equilibrium, we have to think about what type of equilibrium it is. There's really two very important and very different types of equilibria that can affect systems, all right? Equilibria can be stable and equilibria can be unstable. So one way to think about this is to think about these two different systems. One is this pencil that is balanced on its tip, all right? And that system is not moving, right? So it's at equilibrium. This is an equilibrium point because the pencil itself is stationary. It's right there, just like population growth was stationary in this, sorry, in this figure here. Population growth is, there we go. Population growth is stationary here, just like this pencil here is stationary, it's not moving. This is another example of an equilibrium. This picture that's, that's hung up on the wall with this nail and the picture is stationary on the wall. It's not moving, it's at equilibrium. All right, so two equilibria. One is stable, one is unstable. They're both equilibria, but the question here is what happens if you perturb the system? What happens if you do something to change the state of the system? Does it return to its original state or does it go into a totally different state? So if you perturb this pencil, it may be balanced very carefully and ideally there shouldn't be any wind or anything because nothing can perturb it. Because what if it does get perturbed? Well, gravity will take it plummeting to the ground and it will be in a totally different state. So that is an unstable equilibrium. It may be at an equilibrium, but if you move it, if you touch it, if you perturb it, it will change system in a, into an entirely different state when the pencil is now on the floor. Here's a different example. Now, if you perturb this picture, if you move it from side to side, if you move it up, it's gonna move back. If you move it up the other way, if you push it this way, it will move back. And so this equilibrium could be considered a stable equilibrium because if you perturb it, if you move it, it just moves all the way back to where it was. And so it's stable because if you perturb it, it goes back to the same exact state. So the question to you and that we'll be looking at in more detail in lab two is, is carrying capacity a stable equilibrium? Or this, this point here in this figure, is this point a stable equilibrium? or is it an unstable equilibrium? So we're gonna use Insight Maker to evaluate that question. And in fact, we'll have a little chance to do it before lab because the, we're, we have a, an exercise to go, uh, hopefully that will make logistic growth, this model of logistic growth that is described by this mathematical equation here. Hopefully the exercise will make that a little more clear. So that will be the next video and I will see you then.